It's time for a prayer request. Yeah. Remember Brother Red. Remember Brother Jim and Sister Sandy. Remember Aunt Dorothy and Sister Ollie. Remember Sister Nina Williams. Remember Sister Dora. Remember Sister Julie and her health needs. Remember Brother Gary and his health needs. Remember Brother Chuck and Sister Rosie both are in the hospital. Brother, Brother Chuck's friend, Scott Hackenberg, has cancer. Fred and Amanda and their marriage problems. Remember Brother Randy and Sister Barb. Remember Pam Webb, still needs prayer. Brother Charlie Sullivan and his health needs. Remember Dave Swinger recovering from a stroke. Remember Larry and Lee Faust and their health. Remember Virgie Johnson and her health. Remember Vicki Carmichael needs lots of prayer. Remember Jenny Witt, she's now at Sarah Moore for therapy. Anybody else have a request? If not, Mr. Sister Linda, would you like to take some more in prayer and remember these requests? Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for another week that you've brought us through. We just praise you for your love and your goodness. Just now, we lift up these prayer requests to you. You've heard them, you know about them, and we place them in your hands. We trust you with them, Lord. We just ask your blessings on this service. In your holy name we pray, amen. 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 Well, again, I get to say good morning. Glad to have everybody here this morning. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place to be be able to be in God's house to be able to praise the Lord. You know, the uh, nation of Israel, <clears throat> many times in their history, did not have the privilege we have today. Many times in their history, they were uh, being attacked, they were under siege, uh, they were imprisoned, uh, they were taken away, just all sorts of different things. Uh, as a military person, and I know Brother Jim and uh, Brother John, Brother Bob, uh, we all know this uh, privilege of living in a country that has never been occupied. We, we live in a country that is free. Now, I'll, I'll grant you, we've got to pay taxes and there's a bunch of anarchist knuckleheads out there that think this is the worst country possible. I would love to buy every one of them a one-way ticket to North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Syria. There's a whole bunch of places. The Congo, they could go. They, they could learn what a really great nation is. And, and I say all that because there's only one reason we are a great nation. We are one nation under God. Say that with me. One nation <laughs> under God. Those last two words are the important ones. It's good to say we are one nation, but we are one nation under God. And if we ever, ever, ever decide we don't want that, well, we may not be one nation. We may be broken up and separated and all sorts of different things occur. But being one nation under God, how many of you remember, and, and I was really kind of excited to, to think about this this morning, how many of you remember the special prayer request we did last week about the farmers? Yeah. Guess what happened? Now, was it our prayers? No, not our prayers alone. Our prayers assisted the causing of the rain to go that way. <laughs> uh, our farmers around here uh, are picking beans, picking corn. Uh, I didn't see any of them picking cotton, but well, whatever. <laughs> They've been picking beans and picking corn for the last few days. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't drive around uh, Marion, Morrow, Delaware County uh, out in the outback without getting your car covered with soybean dust or corn dust or something along those lines and it's it's got to be the only thing we can we can do is raise our hand and say thank you lord thank you. because if that rain that could have come this way had come this way they'd be sitting at home today 
wondering if in the next six or seven days it's going to dry out enough to where they could. But uh, it proves the power of prayer. Not just our prayer. Our prayer was a part of it. I have absolutely no doubt. But I also have an abs absolutely no doubt that there were farmers and their wives and their sons and their daughters and their daughters-in-law and their sons-in-law saying, Almighty God in heaven above, help us through this. We don't need this rainstorm. And the really neat part about it was, even though it did go east, it didn't seem to really hurt anybody else over there either. But I thought it was kind of God's way of saying, I heard your prayer when that rainstorm came up to Interstate 70 and took a right-hand turn. And if you think it didn't, go, uh, go find a, a satellite map from last week and watch it come up. It came up kind of going up north-northeast pattern. It hit Interstate 70 and whoops. <laughs> hey, we're supposed to make a right-hand turn here and go to Pittsburgh or something. I guess the rainstorm thought it should, should do because that's exactly what it did. And can we say thank you, Lord? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes. He is good. He hears our prayers. He takes care of us. Bless the name of Jesus. Somebody this morning want to praise the Lord. He's been good to you and you just want to share his blessing. Well, before service is over with, one of the things I, I preach and teach, and I hope everybody here remembers it, never, 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 ever go have any kind of a surgical procedure done without first doing what God's Word says. It says, if you have any sick amongst you, let them call for the elders of the church. They will anoint them with oil, pray the prayer of faith over them. If there is any sin that will be forgiven, and they shall be healed. That's what God's Word says. I didn't make that up. He did. He told us that. So, Brother Charlie, before service is over with today, you just stay back there. We'll, we'll, we'll come to you. It says, if you have any sick amongst you, let them call for the elders of the church. He's all we're going to go there. But uh, somebody else want to praise the Lord this morning. Song or testimony? All hearts and minds clear. Okay. Last week's message, we talked about some of the Old Testament miracles God did for the nation of Israel. I spoke especially about two of my favorites. The parting of the Red Sea, and uh, I shared with a military friend of mine on the internet, uh, we talked about that. Uh, for those of you that don't know, our uh, service every Sunday morning it goes out on the internet, on YouTube, goes out on uh, DVDs. And uh, I was sharing with him about how I would have loved to have been a fly on a palm tree off to the coast of the Red Sea there when uh, the last Israelite stepped up out of the Red Sea and God said, okay, close her up. I would have loved to have seen the reaction on Pharaoh's face when he saw that water coming to him. Uh, Pharaoh was not a good guy. He was not a nice guy. He had every opportunity to repent. He had every opportunity to confess his sins. He chose not to. Now perhaps in that last Half second as the water was slamming next to him, he may have, and if he did, I'm going to walk in heaven with him. Do I think he probably did it? This is an opinion of mine, not of God's. It's my opinion of mine. Nope, I don't expect to see that boy in heaven. But that's okay. He chose that, Sister Judy. I didn't choose it for him. He chose that. But uh, he and I... My military buddy and I, we, we kind of laugh about wanting to be a flower on the wall and just see that happen. Uh, they were expecting to overtake Israel. They were expecting to have a slaughter. They were expecting to drag back slaves. And uh, they didn't do it. Sometimes God has a way of doing things that we don't understand. And that was one of those days, I don't think, I don't think Israel realized what was going to happen. And I know the, the Egyptians had no idea what was going to happen. They thought, that, they thought they were going to really do something that day. They were going to be all right. Well, it didn't turn out that way. But we talked about that one. We talked about God stopping the sun in the middle of the sky. 
And again, you know, the scientists say, nah, that couldn't happen. Well, there's historical evidence that it did, not only in the Bible, but secular history bases say that it did happen. Uh, even without the secular thing, my Bible tells me it happened. That's all there is to it. It happened. If it, you know, if, if people have a problem with that, well, they have a problem with God. Well, they have a problem with me. I didn't say it. He did. Praise the Lord. But we talked about those two, and we talked about a few others. But if you study the Bible, you study the Old Testament, you study the New Testament, in the Old Testament, God, through his prophets, uh, through his hand, uh, he did, and, and somebody, I don't know who it was, somebody went through the Old Testament, and he took a ink pen, and he marked out every miracle he could find. And if I remember correctly, it was like 82 Old Testament miracles. And I had to laugh. If you'd been sitting there next to me when I was looking this up, uh, he went through the New Testament too. And again, if, if my memory serves me correct, in the New Testament it was 83 miracles. <laughs> I don't know how true uh, that was. I have not sat down and, and done the miracle search. I, I took his word for it. 82 in the Old Testament, 83 in the New Testament, if my memory serves me correct. Well, over 160 documented, absolute positive miracles. Things that man could not do, but God did. We laughed last Sunday about the axe head that fell into the Jordan River. And the prophet that was there uh, was told, the axe head, the iron axe head was borrowed. What are we going to do? And he went off someplace and cut a limb off a bush, and I have no idea what bush it was, it doesn't say. He just cut a limb off, threw it in the water, and then it says the axe head swam. I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure I could do anything but stand there and laugh to watch an axe head swim up to where the guys could reach out and pick it up. Uh, but that's what the Bible said happened. The axe head swam up. But a lot of the miracles of the Old Testament were more for the group, the big picture. When we begin to look at the miracles in the New Testament, a lot of them were very, very, very personal. The very first miracle that Jesus Christ did, and if you remember in, in studying your Bible, the Bible actually tells you this is Jesus Christ's first miracle. He was at a wedding in a little place called Canaan. His mother was there. His brothers were there. They had been called to the wedding. And all of a sudden, they were out of wine. Which, in those days, was something a groom just did not do. It would be kind of like uh, having a wedding here at church and everybody getting ready for that piece of cake and the bride saying, Oh, gee, I forgot to get a cake. Got to have wedding cake. Well, in those days, you had to have wedding wine. And uh, I don't know how Jesus did it. Again, science says, Brother Jim, that couldn't be done. But Jesus said, fill up the water pots with water. Just fill them up. There's six of them back there. And each one of them had about five or six gallons of water in them, you know, like five gallon tubs. He told them to fill them up. He says, now take a ladle of the water and take it over to the governor of the feast, the governor of the wedding, and see what he thinks about it. The governor tasted it and said it was the best wine he had ever drank. He says a lot of times at the wedding, he said, they put good wine out, and when people were about half drunk, they put the bad wine out. He said, you saved the good wine for last. Best wine that ever hit the face of this earth was the wine that Jesus Christ created. I guarantee you there's never been a better one anywhere, Brother Jim. But that was his first miracle. And some people say, well, you know, he just got a bunch of people drunk. No, he didn't. Uh, there may have been some people that imbibed a little bit too much, but probably not. Wine in those days was fermented more than anything else to the point that it was pure enough to drink. The water that came down from the Jordan River, the water out of the wells in Israel, generally speaking, not all, but generally speaking, is not fit to drink. The making of wine introduces alcohol. The alcohol kills the bugs, and you can drink it. Little kids, 
the youngsters, you know, we're talking infants, they're given wine along with their milk. Uh, get them used to it. And by the time they're six, seven, eight, ten years old, water, I ain't drinking none of that stuff. Give me a glass of wine. But the groom would have been seriously um, talked bad about. Um, he would have been seriously embarrassed had he not had uh, the extra wine that Jesus made. Jesus made it. And it, what this miracle proves to us, if we stop and think about it, is Jesus and God the Father care for everything that is a part of our life. They care for us in every way there is possible to care. He cared for this groom, something that, you know, we would, if the bride out here said, well, we ain't got no wedding cake, one of us might run down to Myers and, you know, buy a chocolate cake and bring it back up, cut it up. You know, we would, we would try to do something uh, just to help out. That's what Jesus did. He did it to help out so that the groom and the bride would not be embarrassed. One of his last miracles was a very pointed miracle in my estimation. It wasn't the last one, but it was one of his last ones. He and his disciples had been down along the Jordan River. They came up through Jericho. And as they were leaving Jericho, last time, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Within a few days, Jesus is going to be crucified, buried, and rise again. But this is his last time through Jericho. And we don't know how many times he has gone through Jericho, but as he leaves the gates and he's walking out, there's a blind man sitting there begging. And he asks what the commotion is. What's the commotion? What's everybody talking about? There's a buzz going on. And somebody told him that Jesus of Nazareth was leaving town. <laughs> he threw off that beggar's coat. You had to have a beggar's coat. I don't know exactly how it was made, but I do know I've read about it that there was a, a, a type of garment that you had to have in order to be a beggar. He chose not to be a beggar anymore. He threw that coat off. And I don't know how a blind man runs someplace and doesn't kill himself in the process. But he got to Jesus. In my opinion, he got there pretty quick, says Lee. <laughs> Jesus asked him, he said, what is it you would like to have? He said, I'd like to have my sight. Jesus healed him that moment, in that time, on that day. And we've all, we've all laughed about this. What was the end result of Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus? <laughs> Bartimaeus had to go get a job. Praise the Lord. Isn't it wonderful that he could go get a job? Isn't it wonderful that God healed him so that he could be whole? There's a story, though. Story is the wrong word. There is an element in this story that needs to be said, though. I don't know how many times Jesus Christ was down in Jericho, but this was the last time, Sister Linda. Had Bartimaeus thought, well, you know, I'm eating a cookie here. I, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll wait for him to come back next time. Or, well, you know, I, my, my leg's kind of cramping. I, I don't really feel like getting up. Uh, I he'll be through here another time. Had any of those thoughts or anything similar came to Bartimaeus' head, Bartimaeus would have died blind. That's all there is to it. Because Jesus was not coming back that way. But today we want to also focus on some other miracles that Jesus did. Uh, and we want to impress not that God felt it different for Israel, it's just that they were different. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament was basically blessed as a whole. There were individual miracles, yes, but most of the miracles were for the nation of Israel for large groups. Jesus changed that to a certain extent 
While he did feed 4,000 one time, he fed 5,000 another time. He calmed the sea so that the disciples wouldn't die in the ship while it was rocking back and forth in the big storm and so forth. While all of that did occur, most of the miracles that Jesus took showed us that he really, really, really did most of the miracles for the individual person. Those miracles are waiting for us. I can't claim, I can't name, I can't tell you what my next miracle is going to be. But I'm here to tell you, as your friend, as your pastor, and just as that hillbilly that lives down the street there, Jesus Christ has a whole pocket full of miracles, and I don't think I've got my last one yet. I believe that he's going to provide more miracles in my life. And I believe he's going to provide more miracles in your life. Because he loves me and he loves you. Everyone who's born again, bought by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Hang in there. Miracles are coming. But I wanted to share one, especially with you this morning. Uh, that if it occurred today... A lot of men wouldn't have anything to do with it. They would see the miracle coming up and they would slide out of the way. They would find someplace else to be. They would not want to handle it. This miracle found Jesus in the temple area. And apparently he was squatted down and was writing in the sand. He heard the people coming. And of course, he, him being the son of God, he knew what was happening. This group of men had found a woman, and they were bringing her to him for judgment. Uh, this woman was a downtrodden woman. Uh, she had seriously done something wrong, and uh, this is what we find. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Would you bow your heads? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Father, in Jesus' name, thanking you for all of your wondrous blessings. Father God, I raise my hand and I thank you for the miracles that you provided for me in my life. I know I could not sit down and list every one of them. And the reason I know I could list every one of them is because I don't know every one of them. Undoubtedly, there have been miracles that you have done in my life that I did not see, did not understand. I looked around and thought, well, this sure is great, not knowing where it came from. But we do know that you love us. We do know that you care for us. We do know that you do miracles in our lives. And we thank you, Father, that you do through Jesus Christ. Provide the miracles. Provide the needs that we have through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, and sometimes through the hands of friends and family, loved ones. Sometimes through the hands of neighbors and Sometimes through the hands of enemies. But nonetheless, however the miracle comes, we thank you, Father, for it. In Jesus' name, they all said, Amen. Amen. Well, these men who brought her and judged her, judged her for immediate and painful death. The serious part about this is they were 100% legally correct. There is no fault to be found in their judgment, no fault to be found in their thought pattern. Now, as a pastor and as a person, I have to ask the question, how did they catch her in the very act? I've often thought, Sister Linda, it was a setup. I may be wrong. Uh, I will probably die still thinking it was a setup. Uh, you don't catch people doing wrong such as this at just the exact appropriate time 
where you could take the person down and have them judged and so forth. I truly believe this was a setup. But again, set up or not, they were legally correct in what they did. Were they morally correct? Yeah, depends on the morality you want to put to that. Were they ethically correct? Again, were they compassionately correct? Not in this lifetime. Were they correct in their possible forgiveness? No way. After this was all over and done with, though, we see this. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. All of us who have come to Jesus Christ and asked for forgiveness of sin, those of us who have confessed our sin, however we did it, we know how she felt at that moment, realizing her sins were forgiven. Now, there will be those, and I have heard the rumblings and the mumblings, well, you know, I didn't hear her repent. I didn't hear her confess. I'm not sure that that was the right thing to do. Well, let me tell you what, friends. I'm going to tell you it was the right thing to do. I did not hear her confess, and I did not hear her repent, but I'll guarantee you somebody else did. Those of you who have Facebook at home, I'm sure you've probably seen this. The first picture is one of these little picture boards where you can take the little white letters and you can stick the little white letters on them. The little white letters got legs and they stick in the board in the cracks. And the first board up on top, it says, Dear God. And then the person took the letters and just stuck them in there. Some of them are sideways. Some of them are over top of each other. It just fills up the whole board and it looks ugly. And you say to yourself, What the heck is that? Then you go down to the second board, and it says, Dear child, I understand Jesus. Amen. This woman, no doubt, when she was captured, maybe that's the wrong word, but when they came and got her, she realized, looking around, it was the Pharisees, it was the Sadducees, it was the Sanhedrin. She knew, without a doubt, she was in some kind of deep trouble. And as they walked along to come back to the temple, she watched some of the men as they would walk along, and one of them reached down and picked up a stone, and one of them reached down and picked up a rock. She knew what was coming. And perhaps, how many, how many of you here you had a son or a daughter that really did something wrong. And you told them, come here. And they, oh, don't look me. I don't want to stand anymore. I will never do it again. I, I promise I'll, I'll be good. I, yeah. How many of us have been there done that? You know? <laughs> We've all seen that little thing. And maybe, just maybe, as she was going with them, she had that same conversation with them. If you let me go, I'll never do this again. I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I, I ask their forgiveness. And maybe as she did that, some of them might have thought, well, but there's too many. It's the crowd thing. You know what I mean? It's the crowd thing. The crowd wants to do this, so you can't go against the crowd. So they brought her to Jesus. And we all know, you, you all read this story. I left out the other part. You all read this story where Jesus said, whoever amongst you that is without sin, you cast the first stone. They dropped their rocks and left because all of them realized they had sin in their life. But that's, none of that is the part that really counts. Whether or not she had that conversation with them, I believe absolutely. 100% in my mind, Sister Pam, 
she had that conversation with God. Never mentioned, never audibly put forth, perhaps not even a lot of tears, but there was enough of a confession in her heart that Jesus Christ read and heard. There was enough repentance in her heart and in her mind and in her soul that Almighty God heard. That Jesus said this, Neither do I condemn thee. Go <laughs> and sin no more. What a wonderful, 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 wonderful statement. I am so glad I heard that statement, Brother Bob. Not in that conversation, but at the end of my repentance, December 25th, 1977, about 9.15 p.m. I am so glad I know when that happened. <laughs> uh, it was about 9 o'clock when Brother Kern called for the altar call. It was about 9 o'clock when her brother went up first. And a few minutes later, little fella, I forget his name offhand, little fella in front of me turned around and looked at me and said, young man, don't you want to go up there? I was standing there bawling and crying. I knew I was wrong. I knew I needed to go up there. I needed to get that all. And I was kind of like, remember I told you about Brian Brian Bartimaeus? If he had hesitated, that's what I was doing. I was hesitating. I needed somebody to give me that little kick. And Elder Gentleman was standing in front of me, turned around, gave me that little push, Sister Rose. I am so glad I went. I'm so glad I heard that. Praise the Lord. And all of us who have had our sins forgiven know how wonderful this statement by Jesus was. There's other personal miracles done by Jesus during the ministry time that he was on earth. One of the miracles that I often speak about, and for those of you who were here for the little one-act play of the centurion of Capernaum, you know that story. The centurion of Capernaum was the mayor. He was the chief of police. He was the, he's a head honcho. I mean, let's face it. He's a centurion, he has a hundred soldiers, they are the ones who watch over and take care of the city of Capernaum for the nation of Rome. As powerful as that man was, he did not have the ability to touch the servant that he loved. He did not have the ability to heal the servant that he loved. He had to yield to a higher power. What was the higher power he yielded to? This itinerant carpenter. I think his name is Jesus. Somebody go down there and ask Jesus if he'll come up and heal my servant. He sent one of his servants there. And on the way down, he knew his servant was going. He decided he better go himself just in case that servant wasn't able to convince Jesus to come. And they met on the way back to his house, or on the way to his house. He said, I know you can heal my servant. You don't have to come to my house. I'm a man under authority. I, my house is not worthy for a man such as you, Jesus, to even come into. He said, but if you'll just say the word, I know my servant will be healed. And for those of you who've never read the story, let me tell you what happened. He was healed right there and right there. The centurion went home and asked everybody, hey, what happened? Well, about an hour ago he was healed, or half an hour ago. And the centurion stopped and thought about, yep, that's where I was when that happened. Praise God. A personal miracle done for one man. Some people might say, but he should not have done that for the centurion. 
A centurion was a Roman. He was a mean man. He was he don't get to be a centurion by being a nice guy, which is true. But perhaps in his older days, in his elder position, he had mellowed a bit. Whether he had mellowed or not. He somehow, Brother Jim, listened to somebody somewhere that talked to him about Jesus Christ. And he said, I can't do it. But I think I found somebody who can. He went down there and Jesus fixed his servant. We also often talk about another story. And I love this one too. Because of the ending of it. Jesus and some of his disciples, I don't know where they were the time before, but perhaps they were Capernaum, perhaps they were down along the sea coast. They got together and went over to a little city little city called Nain. Nain wasn't even as big as Ashley. It was just a little wide spot in the road is all it was. Still isn't. It's, it's nothing. It's a historical place today. It's not even a city. But they went over there and as they're coming into the city there's a procession coming out. The disciples obviously did not know that they were to be there that day for this purpose. Jesus knew he had to be there that day for that purpose. Because the procession coming out had a widow. And the widow was following the people carrying her only son who had died. And the widow, how else would we be doing if we were the widow? Was probably crying her eyes out. <laughs> oh, I love this story. As Jesus walks up to her, he gives her two words. He says, weep not. If I ask everybody here, have we been there, done that? Maybe not a child. At least a friend, a family, a member, a loved one. This takes me back to Worthington. I can take you to the room I could take you to the desk. I could take you to the chair. I sat in. Lori and I had waited for several years after we got married. Just never seemed to be right. There never seemed to be any money to have kids with. Um, back in the late 70s, uh, you were either on welfare or you worked. And I was in that middle place. I don't, didn't qualify for welfare, and I wasn't high enough up the food chain in the working place to where I could really afford $2,000, $3,000 bucks for a kid. We wound up with PPG, had good insurance. All right, it's time to have a child. In fact, we had talked about it. We had never made a complete decision, but the word or the number that kind of flashed around the family was four. Two girls, two boys. That was the plan. Is that a wrong word to use, plan? It probably is. That was a thought pattern. As we sat there and talked to Dr. Chosey, Daniel had been born, and uh, Lori had gone back for, I don't know, a six-week uh, checkup or whatever. He asked us what our plans were for having uh, more children. And, of course, he was concerned because I'm a double positive. She's a negative. That means no matter what happens, that next child, as Daniel was, will be a positive blood child. All of you have heard the story about a blue baby. Well, that's, that's what we're talking about. The mothers, it's one of the ways, and that's not the only way. The mother's body looks at the positive blood of the child and sees it as an invader sees it as something that needs to be killed, needs to be destroyed. So the mother's body builds antibodies to kill the blood of the child that she's carrying. That's unfortunate, but that's part of, that's part of the way that human beings were made by Almighty God. She had built the antibodies, and we were concerned about that. How did that happen? And Dr. Chosey, <laughs> 
He pulled the rug out from under me. Out from under me. He said, well, there's only one possible way this could ever have happened. Sometime early, er, then Daniel being born or being made, being created, your wife was pregnant at another time. I looked at her and she looked at me and we both shook our head. He said, no, don't shake your head. He said, it happened. He said, probably what happened was the child was conceived and two or three weeks later, before she ever even really knew she was pregnant, she lost the child. Never even realized that she was losing the child. <sighs> I really wanted to tell him, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're dumb on a box of rocks. That couldn't happen. Because if that happened, we can't have any more children. And he said, Dwight, I'm sorry to tell you this, but that's where it is. I said, well, what do we do if we decide we want to have more children? Because we were counting on the shot that she had had to take care of that to where we could have more children. She would have another child, get another shot, have another child, get another shot, have another, you know, one of those things. But he said, no, the shot was a waste of time. If Lori has any more children, because Daniel was already born with the defect, defective part. Every possible child defect is double, triple, quadruple, if not ten times. He said, you're looking at the possibility of something worse than a child born with two holes in his heart. It didn't take us long to sit there and make the decision that we would have no more children. We, just, we decided not to bring any more children in this world that would have to go through worse than what Daniel had to go through. But as I left there, I wanted to go have a funeral someplace. I wanted to somehow get some kind of closure for my other child that I had lost, that I never knew a thing about. But let me tell you the secret to this. It's this story that we're talking about right now. This widow came out bawling and crying because her son was dead, and the Lord Jesus Christ told her, weep not. Because the promise is you are going to be reunited with him. She was that day. Brother Jim, I'm still waiting. I'm going to tell you something, son. One of these days, I'm going to walk into heaven. And I don't know if that was a boy. I don't know if that was a girl. But I'm here to tell you that was a child. And because that was a child and that child was conceived, that child had a soul. And because that child died, that soul was taken back to heaven. And one of these days, Sister Rose, I'm going to find that baby. Amen. I'm going to hug that baby's neck. It may not call me daddy. It may say, hi, brother Dwight. That's fine. I can handle that. But my promise is just like she got. We not. Reunion is coming. One day we are going to be restored to our loved ones. Another story of mine that I love out of the New Testament concerned a woman who was sick. Remember we talked about Bartimaeus? Better get out there and get healed while you can. Well, this woman had been sick for 12 years. Jesus' ministry is about halfway done. So she was sick for ten and a half years before Jesus' ministry started. But she's dilly-dallied around for the last year and a half. Spent every penny of money she's got. She's still not healed. After finally going to the doctors and the witch doctors and whoever else and whatever else, Obamacare didn't work for her either. So. She finally decided, she heard about this prophet from over in Capernaum. 
she heard about this prophet that had originally started in Nazareth. I guess he was a, a carpenter, maybe? She heard about it. And the more she heard, the more she liked the idea. And finally, she convinced herself, if I'm ever going to be healed, that's where I'm going to get my healing. So she listened, and she waited, and she watched. Where is he going to be? Can I get to him? And as sick as she was, she finally figured out. Of course, she didn't really figure out. Jesus figured out she needed him. So Jesus went to where she was so that she could, as he walked by, just reach out and touch the hem of his garment. And she was healed 100% right then, right there. Praise the name of Jesus. A lot of people ask me, well, what's, what's the big deal of this story? The big deal of this story is you don't have to do mighty, wonderful works. You don't have to spend two weeks on your knees in prayer. You don't have to prostrate yourself in front of the cross. All you have to do is go to Jesus, praise the Lord. Amen. She did. <laughs> she did and she was healed. The last miracle I want to share with you this morning is a miracle that man cannot do. Now, man cannot do any of these other miracles either, but man can imitate some of these miracles. Perhaps if she had been born in 1950 or 1960, Perhaps she could have gone to a gynecologist. Perhaps she could have gone to a medical doctor. And perhaps that medical doctor would have given her a shot and a handful of pills. And her problem would have been taken care of. That's perhaps. I don't know that to be a fact. But it's perhaps. And perhaps some of these other miracles that we've talked about might have had some semblance of being taken care of through some other means than Jesus Christ. The centurion servant might have, there might have been a pill that would have cured him. A handful of penicillin pills, we don't know. But this last miracle occurred just a few days before Jesus was tried, crucified, and resurrected from the dead. They came down from Bethany, came across the brook Kidron, walked up into the temple area. And as they're walking up into the temple area, Jesus sees a fig tree. And he wonders if there's any figs on it. He gets up there and there's not. The words are not listed in the scripture. But we understand that he cursed the fig tree. Now that's not using profanity. He just pronounced a curse on the fig tree. Oh well, how many of you have a tree in your front yard you'd like to have taken out? You the only one, Rose? Anybody else? Barb's shaking her head. She doesn't want Barb's trees only. Did that be around? I thought that was around. I ain't even sure you call that a tree. That might be a weed. Big weed. He cursed the tree. Next morning. Getting ahead of myself. He cursed the tree. They went into town, came back, passed the tree. Nobody paid any attention to the tree when they passed it. Went on back to Bethany, spent the night in Bethany, came back into Jerusalem the next day down, down across the hill from the Mount of Olives, across the brook Kidron, up the side of the hill, and walked up there, and there's the fig tree. Yesterday, the fig tree was green, vibrant. Alive, pretty. I'm not sure what a fig tree looks like. You know, maybe you guys go home and go on Google and see what a fig tree looks like. But they're getting, they got green leaves and they got brown bark that looks like a tree. People who look at them and see them, they can tell it's alive and well. It's like me. I look at poison ivy. I can tell you, yeah, it's alive and well. Mm -hmm. Watch me walk around too. Poison oak. I walk farther around. But they saw the fig tree that morning. It was alive, green, well, and everything. They walked by it that night, went back to Bethany. The next morning, they come in, and it's dead. Not dying. Not in the throes of turning the leaves. You know, 
If you've got trees at home, especially if you've got a maple tree at home or an oak tree at home, the leaves, they start turning in the fall of the year. They turn, and they turn, and they turn. And they get, some of them get pink, some of them get red, some of them get yellow, some of them get brown. This tree didn't do that. Overnight, overnight, my brother, this tree up and died. The leaves were gone. It was absolutely 100% obvious when they walked up and saw that tree. This dude is dead. And one of the disciples remarked to Jesus, the tree that you cursed yesterday is dead already. If there ever was any doubt in all the miracles that Jesus did, was any of this, and I hate to use this word, coincidence? The word coincidence is not in this Bible. Unless it's on a back page next to a map saying it's coincidence that this country is next to that. It is not in the word of Almighty God. The word luck is not in the Bible either. This was not luck. This was not coincidence. This was a hand of Almighty God. Remember when God the Father said, let there be light, let there be trees, and let them grow up and populate and so forth? Well, Jesus Christ said, let this tree just up and die. And guess what it did? It up and died. Some of you might say, Brother White, I'm not sure that's a miracle. Well, if you're not sure it's a miracle, go home and do it. Well, by the way, make sure you take a picture. You're not going to see this. And make sure down at the bottom of the picture, you've got the time and date stamp. I want to see when you curse it. And then I want you to come out the next day and take that picture and show me the same tree that's really, 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 really dead. And I don't expect to get that email, by the way. But he cursed the fig tree that died overnight. <coughs> two stories in this. One, all things are possible for Jesus Christ. Number two, this fig tree was displeasing to Jesus Christ. People, countries, organizations, governments that are displeasing to Jesus Christ can be as this fig tree did overnight. There is a warning in that miracle. For everything and everybody on the face of this earth, Jesus Christ can take care of that. Don't get yourself in a situation where he might choose to. But as we get ready to close today, I just want to go back up and reiterate this story right here. I want to forget all of the rest of it. I just want to go to this, this part right here. It's the single most important thing of everything I've said today. Neither do I condemn thee to go and sin no more. We're getting ready to leave here today. Very probably, we will never be gathered together again today exactly as we are. The next time we're gathered together, some more will be here that weren't here today. Some won't be here that are here today. And some of that may be permanent, maybe just temporary, but we will never be gathered here as we are exactly today. So let me take the time and let me take the opportunity to say as we go out the back door, make up in your mind, never again am I going to sin. Never again am I going to have to hear this right here. Neither do I condemn thee. Don't give man chance to condemn us. Sister Landa, Sister Rose, would you care? Page 81. Slowly and gently, we sing page 81. Let us make up our mind as we go out the door today. We're not going to have to hear <laughs> the statement of Jesus saying, neither do I condemn thee because someone else has. We're not going to have to hear the statement, go and sin no more. We're planning on not sinning. Let's leave that way.
Let's all stand. We're going to go back in a few minutes and we're going to pray for Brother Charlie. But perhaps before that happens, someone else might have a prayer request, would want to be prayed for, be prayed with. As we sing this morning.